In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You can sit down. So today is the July 2nd. It's the first Saturday of the month of July. So we all strive, of course, to fulfill the five first Saturdays of reparation to the heart of Jesus and Mary, who are so much insulted, so much offended by sins, by our own sins, since we are, we are poor, poor sinners. We are all poor beggars before God, as Father John of the Cross used to say. We're poor beggars before Him. And it's also uh, the great feast of the Visitation. When St. Elizabeth was uh, dwelling with her husband, St. Zacharias, St. Zacharias was the high priest, he saw the angel, the angel told him, don't worry, you will have a son. He doubted. He didn't trust God's word and the angel's word, St. Gabriel. So, so he lost his ability to speak. He was mute. And when he came out of the temple, he couldn't speak. And then he was mute, kind of as a punishment for his doubting God, until St. John the Baptist was born. And when he was born, he said his name is John, and then he was able to speak again. And so during this time, St. Elizabeth was six months with child. The Virgin Mary was only now three months with the living God in her womb. So St. Luke tells us, and St. Luke is the one who sat with the Virgin Mary, and he wrote these things down from her own mouth. That's why St. Luke, more than any, goes into detail about, Beth, about um, Bethlehem and the infancy of our Lord. So the Virgin Mary, says St. Luke, she went with haste through the mountains to visit her cousin, St. Elizabeth. And it was a long journey, and Our Lady... Uh, if, Someone actually calculated the mileage Our Lady would have walked in her lifetime. And it comes to uh, almost walking the entire circumference of the, of the globe. She walked many, many miles in her lifetime. And this was certainly one of the big trips. And when she arrived, St. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And we have the words that, are, that praise the Mother of God. Write in scripture, Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? She says, Who am I that the mother of God should come to me? And this is her cousin. So, Protestants, who are all about following the Bible, how come they don't follow this so simple verse? Who am I that the mother of my Lord, the mother of God, should come to me? And Mary, being the mother of Christ, Christ being the mother of the Mary being the mother of, of Christ, Christ being God Himself, she is by that the mother of God. So in Scripture we see this. Mary prays that the mother of God, Theotokos, as the great council of Ephesus declared. Mary is mother of God. And so Elizabeth um, feels in her womb. St. John the Baptist leaps with and dances with joy in the presence of Jesus Christ the King, who is being carried in the womb of the Virgin Mary, only three months old. The fathers of the church are all unanimous, who say at that moment St. John the Baptist had full use of his reason. Only six months old, he knew exactly what was going on. And he could see the, ch the child Jesus in the womb of the Virgin Mary, and he adored him. And as David before in the, in the Old Testament, a thousand years before, danced before the Ark of the Covenant, so John the Baptist danced before the new Ark, the Blessed Virgin Mary, who carries in her womb the, the living law of God, and not just the dusty Ten Commandments, but the living law of charity of God and neighbor, Jesus Christ the King. And uh, not just bread, that was kept in the old covenant, in the old in the old um, ark of the covenant. There was kept what was called the manna, the food, the breakfast every day God fed the Israelites with for forty years. They had manna all over on the ground, and they would gather the manna to eat it for the day. 
and it was uh, something like a very rich, uh, thick, honey-tasting bread. And they, they called, that's what manna means, manu, what is this? And that's what the Israelites called it, manna. But God fed the Israelites. He fed them from heaven, with bread from heaven. <coughs> and so the Virgin Mary carries in her womb the living bread that comes down from heaven, which is our Lord Jesus Christ, who will be very soon giving himself the living bread to you in Holy Communion, to fill your soul with his divine light, to burn off the rust of our sins and evil inclinations, to strengthen us and to fuel, fuel us, and flame us with the love of God and the love of our neighbor and the love for Jesus Christ the King. Right. And really, really, in the, the, the right. fight of our day, the fight of our time, is really a test all of us are being put to. Who do we love most? Do we love our friends at the parish? Do we love our friends in the priesthood? Do we love our priories and comfort? Do we love our this and our love our that? We're all being put to the test in this crisis of the church. Do you love me more than these? And our Lord is asking all of us, do you love me to follow me to prison? Follow me to, to a discouraging, the crowning with thorns, to Calvary. And we're not the first ones. How many, how many of our ancestors in the Catholic faith have had to literally be imprisoned like in England during the persecutions or in France during the Protestant Revolution the, the revolution in France England and Germany during the Protestant Revolution and the communist, uh, communist attacks in the 1910s, uh, 20s, 30s, 40s and 50s in Ukraine, Russia, Mexico and in, um, even in Spain how many Catholics put to death went to martyrdom. 11 million in the first 300 years of the Catholic Church history. 11 million at least, 11 million martyrs. Children this age, little Perpetua's age and, and um, Raoul's age, a three-year-old confessed the Catholic faith and the, the governor threw him down on the ground and bad, dashed his brains out on the steps. And he's a little martyr. The Jews in the, night, in the 1400s crucified Saint Simon of Trent, a little boy of nine years old. They crucified him and tortured him in mockery of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the living bread from heaven that Mary carried in her womb is, is Jesus Christ. And Saint John the Baptist, in that moment, he received sanctifying grace. It was his baptism, really. And then um, Virgin Mary carried in her womb the true eternal priest. Jesus Christ is the eternal high priest. All the Old Testament priesthood of Aaron and the Levites who offered animal sacrifices, it was only to prepare and, and point to Jesus Christ and his priesthood. That's why he's called a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now who's Melchizedek? He's a strange character in the Old Testament. He shows up out of nowhere. He's a high priest. He's higher than Abraham because Abraham pays tithes to him. And he's a real priest. But there's no description of his lineage. And he offers bread and wine as a sacrifice, which was quite unusual. Because the usual sacrifice was first fruits or animals, especially lambs. Because that's what God asked. But this priest of the Old Testament, Melchizedek, offers bread and wine. And this is a direct connection to our Catholic Mass, when Jesus Christ, the Eternal High Priest, will take the wine and bread at the, at the First Mass, the Last Supper, and, and, and change it, transubstantiate, work the miracle of transubstantiation, which He does every Mass, into His very body, blood, soul, and divinity. And this sacrifice which was performed the day before Good Friday. Think about that. Christ was not yet crucified on the cross, right? On Good Friday. But the day before, the night before, took place the sacrifice of Calvary on the altar 
of the Last Supper in the upper room with his apostles. Think about that for a minute. How can the sacrifice of the cross take place the night before it happened? That's called the mystical sacrifice. It really was his sacrifice already before it took place. So now, every time after Good Friday, every time a priest says Mass, down to the end of the world, that same mystical sacrifice, if God can take that sacrifice and apply it before it happened, he can take that sacrifice and, of course, apply it many times after with every true valid Mass. And that's why at Mass, we are on our knees. We adore the living God, the, 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 the true High Priest, the true living bread from heaven, and the true law of God, love of God and neighbor, which is expressed highest in the sacrifice of the cross. And so, dear faithful, uh, here we are gathered in Nickelville, our Nickelville-ish area, upstate New York, beautiful place, and beautiful in the summer. Many of you have driven many miles. And what draws us, of course, to, this, to the sacrifice of the Mass in this crisis is the battle for the Catholic faith. And it's, it is a battle. It is a war. The devil is unleashing every, every single weapon he has to break the Catholic resistance. He does not want to see revive the Catholic Church of the old style. The one Christ instituted. The one Peter is the head of. And he wants to replace it, this counterfeit conciliar church. This counterfeit conciliar church has grown like weeds. It has taken over Rome. It has darkened Rome with modernism. It has replaced the true sacrifice with the, the abominable new mass. And if it's not the abominable new mass, it has replaced the heads of the priests who offer the old mass, but with the abominable counterfeit church infecting their heads who accept Vatican II, who accept the conciliar Mass. And so those priests are also infected in those, those Masses we cannot attend. Any priests, any bishops, any congregations that's, that compromise with Vatican II and the new Mass, we have to stay away to keep the faith. Vatican II, just look at the ravages after 50 years. Bishops, priests, popes, Millions of faithful have lost the faith. They have, they have replaced it with a new religion. And we want nothing to do with this religion. We choose by God's grace. We desire with all our heart to stay Catholic and to stay in the line of all the popes of tradition. And our founder, Archbishop Lefebvre, who was not just an ordinary bishop, although he was quite, quite ordinary, the great thing about Archbishop Lefebvre, as uh, Father Gregory Hess once said, the great thing about Archbishop Lefebvre was that he was totally uncreative. He was totally ungenious. All he did was hand down what he received. And that was the faith of all time and the mass of all time. We've heard, we had enough, we're, we're quite nauseous now of all this new creations and and ingenuity, playing with the Mass, playing with our Catholic faith, playing with the sacraments. We've had enough of it. Give us what Archbishop Lefebvre handed down to us. The true faith, the true Mass, and without games. And so we are now in the middle of a, of a huge war, and you have to stay strong. There are few faithful that are left to stand up and battle for the faith. Because it's easy to go with the new direction of Bishop Filet. It's easy to go with it. So it's more comfortable. And uh, quite honestly, the priests now, as you know, they say nothing has changed. But a lot has changed. I've been here in Nickelville. I was here seven years. As all the priests throughout the whole world, we always preached against any false agreement with Rome. We always preached against modernist Rome. We always warned uh, the faithful, do not go with the new mass. We must disobey these modernist popes. They have a right to our disobedience. We pray for them. And we uh, pray their name in the mass and so forth and so forth. But we must 
they have a right to our resistance. And now, if Father Seuss or if any society priest now gets up and preaches against the agreement with Rome, they are instantly punished and silenced. It's a fact. And, a, and a, it, uh, an order has come out from all the, from Menzingen to all the priors. This came out in 2012. Don't you dare speak about the agreement with Rome nor anything so-called political from the pulpits. And if any priest dares to do that, they have to answer to the district superior. And that's how, how come preaching the Catholic faith now has become uh, suddenly something to be silenced about. When the very heart of our fight, as Archbishop Lefebvre always said, was this fight, this conflict between our hijacked Catholic Church against this conciliar Church of Rome. And this, this is what has been failed. Last week, Bishop Follet came out with the decision of all the 40-something priests. It's about three paragraphs long. It's a very short statement. It doesn't say much. But what's not there is glaring. And what's not there is any mention of Vatican II and all its heresies. No mention of the conciliar church. And uh, it says in there, we will not seek pri primarily the canonical agreement. But it doesn't say they won't. And it calls it a blessed day, a blessed day when this will happen. So again, it's this fuzzy language. And many people are saying, see, there's no agreement, no agreement. But this statement is simply, let's say what it is. It's in the, in the steps of the revolution, there's always two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. That's how the revolution works. That's how they did it at Vatican II. They all, and those of you who lived through Vatican II, that's exactly how it happened. Two steps forward, one step back. Change the mass, change the, the, uh, the, the rituals, but uh, keep some Latin. Two steps forward, two, one step back. Pope John Paul II, the CC meeting, uh, joining all religions to pray together, but one step back, he tells the clergy, wear your habits and the nuns, stay in your habits. So see, the, the Pope is really traditional. So this is how the revolution works. And it's, we can't be duped this time. And it's been going on for four years now, sad to say, in our dear society in Pius X, our once dear society in Pius X, when Vatican II took place in the SSPX four years ago, 2012, that's when it took place. And let's be aware of two things. Let's be aware of two things. One, the leader, the liberal leaders of the Society of Pius X now are saying, Bishop Lefebvre, what he said in 88 was good for 88. But now, 2016, 2012, 14, 15, these years, we have, to, Bishop Lefebvre would have gone in with Rome. He would see that now is the time to make an canonical setup with modernist Rome. So they say, well, this is what Archbishop of Feb would want. We have to go this direction. Prudence, they say. But there's other ones who say, look, Archbishop of Feb was right in 1988 not to trust Rome. And now, 2016, we have a Pope worse than ever, who just last week said that the Catholic Church has to apologize to the, to the Sodomites for condemning their sins. And this, this is a, a terrible heresy. A terrible scandal to the faithful. So they say, well, 2016, if Archbishop Lefebvre was alive now, he would see that this Pope is not Pope, and he would go sit in the Contes. So you got, you got two people who are in the name of Archbishop Lefebvre, two directions. One saying, let's go in with modernist Rome. After all, there are the, he's the Pope, we have to be under the Pope. The other ones are saying, no, he's not the Pope, he would be said of and uh, I think it's very clear to you, all you faithful, we have to avoid these two fit pitfalls. They're both errors. One, the error of going in with Rome and making peace with these destroyers of the church. The Pope is still Pope. Archbishop Lefebvre dealt with Pope Paul VI. 
John Paul II, and uh, these were bad popes. They were, in a, in a way, more modernist than Pope Francis, in a way. Because Pope Paul VI, he's the one that took the sledgehammer to the Mass. Someone had to put the sledgehammer, and it was him. And it was Pope Paul VI who lied prostrate before the Orthodox Bishop, the schismatic Bishop. So, Archbishop Lefebvre didn't fall into Sedevicantism. And he, didn't, he saw that we can never make peace in the Catholic Church with a Pope whose ideas were filled with the revolution of the Vatican II. So on the one hand, it's not the time to make peace with modernist Rome. And that time will be when the Pope is perfectly Catholic, as he told the four bishops. Nor is it, <clears throat> nor would the Archbishop fall into Sedevicantism, which is a very big temptation, especially to priests who leave the conciliar SSPX, the, the Sedevicantes jump right on them, and they, they easily fall into this trap. And it's a, we are in dangerous times. It's not only hard times, it's very dangerous times for all of our souls. We are in very dangerous times. And even in these four hard long years since the Vatican II and the society, four long hard years, we have seen, Father Pfeiffer and I and many of the priests of the resistance, we have seen good people slide into Sedevicantism. Good souls slide into, well, we just have to go in with the conciliar church anyway because he's the Pope. And now we have young priests coming out of Winona who are saying to the youth, we have to come under the Pope. With no distinction of the conciliar church in the, in the Catholic Church. So, let us just reread, reread the great declaration of 1974 of Archbishop of Fath. You really got to study that, pray over it, and see he hit it right on the nail. We reject modernist Rome, but we still pray for the Pope because he's head of he's head over two churches. But we have to reject this conciliar church. So, if I might bear on your patience a little longer, let me just read to you. Lest we forget some of the great sayings of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. And his stand was very, very clear. It couldn't have been more clear. And I think the Virgin Mary foretold Archbishop Lefebvre 300 years ago in Quito to be for us a light in this confusing time. He, he was a grace for the church. And his greatness, like I said, was not inventing anything new. He just handed down what he received. And that's what we praise of the, of the true society of Isaac 10 and of the resistance. That's what we want to pass down. That's what we want to keep alive is the faith of our, of our, of the whole magisterium of the church and the whole stand of Archbishop Lefebvre. And Archbishop Lefebvre also understood <coughs> until the Pope consecrates Russia <clears throat> the diabolical disorientation is going to keep affecting all the bishops and, and priests. Look at, look at the sad... I mean, we, it's hard for me to speak of this because I have a great admiration and a great esteem for the one who trained me in the priesthood, of Bishop Williamson, six years in the seminary. And you all know him, we all loved him in the United States and Canada. He, he stood so clearly and strong but how is it possible that a great prelate like this can now be taking a position saying that the new mass miracles are real? Saying that the new mass <clears throat> can nourish your faith? Here we are debating among Catholics of tradition whether or not it's okay to go to the new mass. <laughs> That's like arguing over abortion. You just, it's a dead issue. And yet, Souls are being shaken by this. And we need to be warned by history. There was a great bishop, Osius. Osius was his name <coughs> during the Arian heresy. Everyone venerated this old bishop. He was a hundred years old who fought Arian heresy his whole life. And he was there at the council in 325 of Nicaea. He knew, he saw St. Athanasius. He saw Bishop St. Nicholas 
stand up, walk in front of the emperor and punch an Aryan priest in the face and was put to jail for it. St. Nicholas, the great St. Nicholas, the jolly St. Nicholas, he punched a heretic in the face at the council before all the bishops and priests. And when he was in prison, Christ appeared to him with the Blessed Mother and gave him back his, his, his bishop's garments to reward him. So this old Bishop Osias was there. And everyone venerated him because he stood strong for many, many, many years. But what happened to Osias? Strange thing happened. He weakened. And he accepted the neo Aryan heresy. He fell into a semi-Aryan heresy. And he died without the faith. Scary thing for all of us. Scary truth. So even great ones who have been long in the war can tri trip, trip up. And we are in very dangerous times. So how do we survive this? You know, how do we survive? Our Lady gave us the weapons, the rosary, the brown scapular. Stay faithful to the real true Mass with real true priests who are not playing games with Vatican II and the new Mass. And stay close to Jesus crucified. That's where we have to stand now. Jesus crucified. Listen to Archbishop Lefebvre and uh, listen how clear this is. There's no ambiguity, no games. He says to the four bishops in 1987, in his letter to them on August 29th, 1987, I will bestow this grace as bishops upon you, confident that without too long a delay, the See of Peter will be occupied by a perfectly Catholic successor of Peter, into whose hands you may place the grace of your episcopacy so that he may confirm it. Well, that day hasn't come yet, so we have to fight on. The four bishops, every one of them, sadly, have caved in, and we have to pray for them. The conciliar church. This is further proof that this new church, which they are now calling conciliar, is destroying itself. The church which maintains such errors is both schismatic and heretical. This conciliar church is not Catholic. Now remember, be careful and listen, dear faithful. You never hear Bishop Follet anymore speak about the conciliar church. It's, for him, it's one church. He's lost this distinction. And even, sad to say, Bishop Williamson no longer refers to it as the conciliar church, but the mainstream. How is this happening and why is this happening? I don't know. But let's keep our Catholic sense clear. And let's pray to the Mother of God that we hold fast to the end. This conciliar church is not Catholic. To the extent that the Pope, bishops, priests, and faithful adhere to this new church, they separate themselves from the Catholic church. The church today is the true church to the extent where it continues and is one with the church of yesterday and always the standard of the Catholic faith is tradition. The request made by Bishop Benelli in, is illuminating. Submission to the, Catholic, to the conciliar church. This is when they asked him, you must accept the council. Submission to the conciliar church, the church of Vatican II, the schismatic church. The Archbishop Lefebvre, this is in St. Nicolas de Chardonnay, in a conference to his priests in 1984. He said, let us harbor no illusion or believe that this way of putting the brakes on and off due to the abuses of the current situation means that there is a complete return to tradition. So he's talking here about 1984 when they released the Latin Mass. So everybody was saying, see, Rome is becoming traditional again. He said, no, don't fall for this trap. This is not true. This is not true. They still have liberal minds, liberals are in control in Rome, and they are still liberal. He said in 1985, now it is over. They no longer belong to our religion. It is over. They are not Catholic any longer. Speaking of Rome, and he's dealing here face to face with Cardinal Ratzinger. 1986, in his letter to Jean Madiran, we have to deal with people who have no idea of what the truth is. We will henceforth have to consider that this new conciliar church 
is no longer Catholic. So why, why in the world is Bishop Follet playing games with these enemies of Christ? He received the instruction from Archbishop Lefebvre, stay fast in the faith, don't compromise until we have a perfectly Catholic Pope. Archbishop Lefebvre said to the priests in 1986 in Hakon, Cardinal Ratzinger, who is more or less regarded as a traditional by the press, is in fact a modernist. <laughs> In 1987, Rome has lost the faith, my dear friends. Rome has apostatized. What I am telling you is not just words, idle words. It is the truth. Rome has apostatized. We can no longer trust these people. They are no longer in the church. They have left the church. They are quitting the church. This is certain, certain, certain. And you can hear it in French, online, his actual words. And um, so... Did he fall into Sedevacantism because Rome lost the faith? No. We have a bad Pope, so we pray for him, but he's still Pope. We have a bad President of the United States, he's still President. He'll be judged by Christ as President. And we see all throughout the Old Testament, Saul. And Saul went bad, but he was the Anointed One. And David still respected him. And we see Solomon went evil. And many men of the Old Testament who were kings, prophets, and priests who went bad, they did not lose their rank. So Caiaphas, the Old Testament Pope, had Jesus Christ, the living God, in front of him. And our Lord Jesus Christ respected his authority because he respectfully answered him the truth. And this teaches us another bit great lesson. Caiaphas lost the faith. He rejected the living God in front of him. He knew about all his miracles. And so, with the Pope, the same thing. We have a Pope who holds the throne. If he holds heresies, he doesn't lose the, the papacy. Now, and, and there's a lot of hot debates among theologians about this. But our, our great example is Archbishop Lefebvre never fell into this. A big lesson for us. Archbishop Lefebvre, 1988. We will no longer have any contact with La Barue. That's when uh, Dom Gerard and La Barue, the monastery of the Benedictines, when he made the agreement with modernist Rome. Archbishop Lefebvre said we will no longer have any contact with La Barue, and we will warn all our faithful that they should no longer support something which is now in the hands of our enemies. The enemies of our Lord and of his reign over the whole world. Okay, um, 1988, September, Archbishop Lefebvre. Recently we were told that it was necessary that tradition enters the visible church. I think that this is a very, very serious mistake. Where is this visible church? The visible church can be recognized by the signs that she has always given of her visibility. She is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. I ask you, where are the true marks of the church? Are they more in the official church? I don't mean the visible church, but the official church. Or at home, in what we present, what we are. It is clear that it is we who keep the unity of the faith, which disappeared from the official church. A bishop believes in this, believes in this. another does not believe in it. Faith is diverse. Their abominable catechisms include heresies. Where is the unity of the faith in Rome? 1989, interview, July, August, 1989. Get it inside the church, because he was asked, why don't you make an agreement with Rome? You can stay traditional, keep your traditional seminary, keep the Latin Mass, what's wrong with that? Be accepted as you are, as they're saying now. Archbishop Lefebvre, get it inside the church, what does this mean? First of all, what church are we talking about? If this is the conciliar church, this would require that we, who have been fighting for 20 years because we want the Catholic Church, would enter the conciliar church in order to supposedly make it Catholic. It is a total illusion. It is not the subjects who make the superiors, but the superiors who make the subjects. And this is what is being forgotten. If we, as is already happening in Argentina, 
The society comes under the local modernist bishops. Who will decide what the, what's taught in schools? Who will decide what missions open? Who decides what, what priests go where? It will be the local bishop. Very dangerous. And there's many, many, we could go on all day with quotes from Archbishop Lefebvre. But uh, let me just to take a, to a couple more to bear on your patience. But this is very important. Very important for all of us. Some would then be willing to give up, I would say, give up the fight for the faith, saying, let us first re-enter the church. Let us first do everything to integrate the official public structure of the church. Let us be silent about dogmatic issues. This is what's happened now. In the last week's statement of Menzingen, there's no question about doctrine, the fight for the faith, the kingship of Jesus Christ. Let us keep quiet over the issues of religious liberty, human rights, ecumenism. And once we are inside the church, we will be able to do this, and we'll be able to achieve that. And that's exactly what they're saying now. One priest told me, we need to get inside with the, the, under the Pope, and we can fight them face to face. <laughs> Archbishop Lefebvre was re very realistic. This is absolutely wrong, he says. You don't enter into a structure under superiors claiming that you will overthrow everything as soon as you are inside it. Whereas they will have all the means to suppress us. They have all the authority. What, mean, what matters to us first and foremost is to maintain the Catholic faith. This is what we are fighting for. So the canonical issue, this purely public and external issue in the church, is secondary. What matters is to stay within the church, inside the Catholic Church. In other words, in the Catholic faith of all time, in the true priesthood, in the true Mass, in the true sacraments, in the same catechism with the same Bible. That's what matters to us. That's what the Church is. Public recognition is a secondary issue. Thus we should not seek what is secondary while losing what is primary, by losing what is the primary goal of our fight. And so he goes on to say, what is the matter of the faith, it's the matter of the faith. And he goes on to say how the new code of canon law is loaded with heresies, and we cannot accept the new code. And, um, and then he goes and says the fundamental issue is not the Mass, because many people are saying this, all I need is my Mass and my sacraments, I don't care about the politics. But listen to Archbishop Lefebvre. Therein lies our opposition and the main reason why we cannot agree with modernist Rome. The main issue is not the question of the Mass, for the Mass is merely one of the consequences of the desire to draw closer to Protestantism and has to change the worship, the sacraments, the catechism, etc. The true fundamental issue is the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is always the heart of the fight, the reign, the social kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. He saw all through all, all this. Christ must reign, St. Paul tells us. Our Lord came to reign. They say no. We say yes with all the popes. Our Lord did not come in order to be, remain inside our homes only without going out. This is why we cannot agree with them, since we obey our Lord when he told us, told his apostles, go and preach the gospel to the ends of the world. This is why we should not wonder why we just cannot get some understanding with Rome. This is not possible as long as Rome will not come back to the faith in the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. So long as it keeps acting as if all religions were good and equal, we have a disagreement on a matter of faith. Just like Cardinal Bea and Cardinal Ottaviani, Ottaviani, and just like the popes who rejected liberalism, it is the same thing, the same trend, the same ideas, and the same divisions within the church. And none of us like divisions, and we're in another division. Why? Because we cannot play with the new Mass and the new conciliar church. So dear faithful, um, there's many great quotes also about Freemasonry and the Judeo-Masons and the false profession of faith of Cardinal Ratzinger of 1989, which Bishop Follet agrees and, take and accepts. And Bishop Follet was asked recently, do you still 
support what you signed on the doctrinal declaration of 2012? He said, yes, I find nothing wrong with it. Dear faithful, that was the Vatican II in the SSPX. That was the compromise with Vatican II, the new Mass, the new sacraments, the new profession of faith, the new code of canon law. That was it. And everyone's scared of, the, oh good, no agreement. But that's, we fear the agreement precisely because of the compromise of the faith, which happened in 2012. So we're saying to everybody, wake up, it's already happened. The society has already caved in, it's already dead. So dear faithful, these are truly diabolic days, as our Virgin Mary foretold. She's our mother in heaven, she warned us, you're going to live through this terrible hurricane. And she gave us the weapons, and you know what they are. And you know what they are. Keep the faithful the rosary every day. Stay close to the Mother of God, and stand strong in the faith. Fight for it. Fight for it. We have to fight for it. And you've got bishops and priests and martyrs and martyrs, so many martyrs, who fought for the faith before us. This is a great grace in our time to have the faith and to have the grace to fight for it when so many are just going with the flow. And it's easy for all of us to do that. But we've got to stand opposed to this whole modern world which is now more and more rejecting God, his, even the laws of nature anymore. So pick up your weapons, dear faithful flock, and let's imitate our ancestors of old who were ready to die fighting the done compromise. And we've got so many heroic examples of the Catholics in the Maccabees, in Ireland, in Scotland, in Spain, in Mexico. Men who fought to death rather than compromise the Catholic faith. And uh, we must carry on. So let's turn to the Mother of God. She brings her Divine Son to us in the Mass. And we adore Him, the Eternal High Priest, the, to the new law, the living bread from heaven. She always takes us to her Son. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.